the jump. Um, being a veteran, being a Green Beret, do you take offense to Colin Kaepernick kneeling during the national anthem? <laughs> <laughs> oh man, no, no, I don't. Actually, I run a, a long medium piece, like it's outrageously long. It's like a thirty-four minute long read on um, on Medium a couple months ago, kind of describing my stance to that. I think whenever we we frame it like that. Um, it does a great disservice to every black and brown veteran in the United States that's been shit on for the history of the United States. I mean, you got a history of veterans being lynched in uniform after World War One and World War II. Um, so whenever we frame it like this, we we make it we make veteran this veteran status to be a universal thing, a monolithic thing. When in reality, if you're a black veteran or a brown veteran like me. I got pulled over on a bicycle on my way home from Randall Library uh, um, while I was go going to UNCW because I looked suspicious and there had been a lot of break-ins in the neighborhood. And um, and I t he said he needed to search me for weapons. And whenever I said, I'm not going to allow you to search me for weapons, um, you can arrest me, but you're not going to search me. Um, after a while, a couple more cop cars showed up. And that and the other. I finally appeased them and I said, I'll give you some ID. I'll, 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 I'll give you some ID. So I gave him a driver's license and a military ID. And he scrutinizes the driver's license and then he looks at the military ID and he says, oh my God, immediately says, oh my God, I'm so sorry, sir. So there's like a conscious, a conscious, um, I guess, a conscious way of being for him, at least specifically, that he knew that what he was doing, he wouldn't do to someone that he knew was a veteran. Um, mm -hmm. So for me, whenever we talk about uh, the Colin Kaepernick situation, it's just absolutely blown out of proportion. It has nothing to do with veterans, but everything to do with anti-blackness. Yeah. City Heartbeat. On this episode of A Real Dialogue, I chopped it up with Steve Nunez. Now, Steve Nunez is a product of the Port City. He attended Mary C. Williams Elementary School, Williston Middle, and then Ashley High School. After graduating from Eugene Ashley High School, Steve enlisted in the Army and served as a Special Forces Weapons Surgeon for five years. Following his enlistment, Steve contracted as a personal security specialist, taking on an embassy protection detail in Kabul, Afghanistan. After um, working at this position for a while, he began to become disenchanted with American exceptionalism. After becoming disenchanted with American exceptionalism, Steve enrolled at UNCW. Steve completed a BA in Philosophy, Anthropology, and Religion, with minors in Middle East and Islamic Studies as well as Classical Studies. He studied a lot there. <laughs> Currently completing graduate studies at Harvard Divinity School, where Cornell West is his advisor, where he hopes to graduate with a Master's, Master of Theological Studies in Religion, Ethics, and Politics. Following his graduation, Steve hopes to pursue doctoral studies in philosophy focusing on the social and political philosophies of W.E.B. Du Bois and Franz Fanon. Yeah, I, I got much love for uh, the brother Colin Kaepernick for everything that he's doing. I actually... Um, I would love to see. I would love to see 
as much as I hate uh, ownership of the NFL. I mean, that, and that that goes back to like that's what I said in 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 the medium piece was like basically to me I love the NFL and I love NFL athletes and I love the athleticism of NFL athletes and this that and the other. I grew up playing football. Um, but to me, like the NFL now with the owner and, and player structure, it's like a modern day Mandingo show. Is mm-hmm. really the way the yeah. way that that America treats it, and yeah. that's what I think we see. I mean, what Papa John just stepped down yesterday because yeah. of his views on this thing. So we can we can love black bodies whenever they 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 work for us, but but not whenever. It's yeah, actually. as soon as they use their <clears throat> space as a a platform, you mm-hmm. know, to lift up yeah. their fellow Americans, it, yeah. then, yeah, it doesn't fit the narrative. Yeah. That's publicly acceptable. Yeah, man, it's a, it's a mess. Looking back on it, I, um, it wasn't until I was at UNCW that I really learned the history of Wilmington, and I thought that it was absolutely disgusting that it wasn't taught at places like Williston. Um, yeah, did you know about, like, the history of Williston, for example, no, when you were there? No, no. Really, really interestingly enough, it wasn't until I was at UNCW and I started looking at the GI Bill. Because mm-hmm. I was going to school on the GI Bill and I was like, oh, let's look at the history of the GI Bill. And I stumbled across a couple of articles that was like t- describing the racism within the GI Bill. And it's absolutely, absolutely outrageous. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, this might be, you fact check this number, but I think it was something like 80% of black veterans after World War II were denied GI Bill benefits. Um, and that's just from the VA. And then on top of that, of those that did get them, you have black veterans weren't allowed, the schools were still segregated, so they were forced to go to HBCUs, and the HBCUs didn't have the capacity to fill to, to expand fast enough to, to fill the need that black veterans were seeing. So that's a lot another of black veterans, generational. <laughs> another generational, and then yeah, you look yeah. at the housing side. So if you don't know about the GI Bill, the original GI Bill mm-hmm. allowed you to um, start a business, go to school, or buy a house. Yeah. Um, and then the housing side, so yeah. you have all the redlining and this, that, yeah. and, and the other going on, on in that. So even, once you, even if you did get the GI Bill benefits, you're still you're still forced to buy a specific house mm-hmm. in a specific neighborhood and this, that, and the other that's uh, less, that, that ends up having less value over time. Yeah. This, that, and the other, and the generational impacts of that were interesting. So uh, through that, I was like, yo, what <laughs> is going on? Because, like, so, I mean, I guess in order to really, really get into it, I would have to backtrack. So one of the reasons why I enlisted was Islamophobia. Um, I bought into this American project, and after 9/11, I was I was really really angry um, at Muslims, and uh, so I enlisted. Um, and part of that, my my dad's from the Dominican Republic. There was a lot of reasons that I enlisted, but um, yeah, just so <laughs> so I was kind of bought into America. Yeah. I have an American flag tattooed on my ribs, and I still love America. I am. Probably as American as it comes, you know yeah. what I mean, depending on what culture you yeah. look at. But um, yeah, so looking at that, I had never, I, 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 I never really believed in races, especially because I grew up playing sports and this, that, and the other. And I was like, oh, everybody's getting along and this, that, and the other. Yeah. And then over time, I was just like, what the fuck is going on? So when I got to UNCW, I really, really started looking into racism. Mm-hmm. Um, and the philosophy of race, and I got really, really interested in it. Um, through the GI Bill was kind of a jumping off point, and I just started exploring everything, and that's when I fell into looking into the history of Wilmington, and I was absolutely disgusted by by the history of Wilmington mm-hmm. that, I, that I discovered that I didn't know that I was a, I, I mean, we're all a part of it, because it continues today. I mean, we still have the Cotton Exchange down, downtown, we still got all this going on going to enlist was that um, I know you said you know 9-11 definitely affected you um, was that Islamophobia kind of part of the the, um, the army's like marketing back then or like was was it more so just the, the mentality of um, people enlisting or so 
I wouldn't say that it was, I mean, it was part of the mentality of the United States of America. Yeah. Right? Like, yeah. I think that we forget yeah. about that now. Yeah. But, I, I mean, you look is. at, yeah, 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 it definitely is. Mm -hmm. Maybe to a lesser extent, yeah. especially as, it, especially because of the economic impacts. I think a lot of people have problems with us being in Afghanistan for yeah. 17 years. But, um, yeah, I wouldn't say that it was part of the marketing explicitly but yeah. like just like I said um, I think that it's part of the, the ethos of the United States of America at this point um, I think that over time white supremacy has added a lot of things where it, it began specifically in the United States of America as just anti-black mm -hmm. um, because of slavery and this that and the other and, and it was this anti-blackness that allowed us to justify slavery and then over time you see um, like 1965, I think, is a really, really important year because that's the year that we, we open up immigration. Mm -hmm. um, so as we move along, I think we see people get lumped in there. So there's a couple of things, and it's usually dialectic, right? So America is anti-black, America, and then you, you tie anti-communist to anti-black right after the Red Scare, and those get tied together, and you see things like COINTELPRO, mm -hmm. and this, that, and the other, and mm -hmm. the mass surveillance of black culture and black politics, um, black literature, there's plenty of, plenty of literature on that, that period of the Second Reconstruction and, and Hoover's War on Blackness. And then over time, I think another key date is, uh, uh, another key, key time is when communism fell, when the USSR fell. We no longer have this imperial opposition that we had Mm -hmm. with that and I think you see Sam Huntington's uh, Clash of Civilizations comes out in 93 and this that and the other and I think that's really you already had some programs like we're already in Afghanistan fighting the Soviets anyway and we're already we're at war with Saddam in the 80s mm -hmm. so I think that you have a lot of these examples of like oh oh Islam is a problem yeah. Just monolithically, Islam is a problem, and I think that that gets lumped into this monolithic thing, and throughout the 90s, that expands as one of the, the driving forces of American public policy, and then in 2001, it just blows up. Yeah. <clears throat> it just blows up. Now, we can get into... Into 9/11 and, and this, that, and the yeah, other, and yeah. I don't know what yeah. happened that day, but I know that it wasn't what the 9-11 Commission report states. Um, so, yeah, I think that, that the Islamophobic rhetoric has a very, very long-standing trend that's actually, I'm hoping to write a dissertation on that, the mm -hmm. degree to which the Negro problem has been compounded by this terrorist problem. Yeah. Which, which, so, in other words, black people are innately criminal mm -hmm. in very, very similar ways that we portray Muslims as innately violent. Yeah, and the other, and I think that I that definitely the think there's a racial caste system in the United Absolutely. States. Absolutely, I think it's undeniable. Yeah. So, what? Um, at what point did you sort of uh, change your your beliefs on on Islam and um, you know sort of distinguish is extremism? with, uh, you know, like, uh, mass, like, you know, practices on So, like, even the word extremism, I, I find yeah. problematic, mm -hmm. because it's dialectic to, like, oh, there's a normal Muslim, and there's an extreme Muslim, or there's a normal black person, and there's a, a black identity extremist, uh, yeah, cause I think that, so, yeah. So, yeah, even just framing it in that language, I think, is one of the reasons, is one of the ways that we got here, but I, mm -hmm. I'm not sure exactly, it didn't happen overnight, it happened, yeah. it happened over time, but I, uh, I had experiences, um, particularly while I was, while I was working for the Department of State, where I, I met a lot more Muslims and, and really, really, really felt the love of of Muslim of the Muslim community in, in in Kabul. Like I've never walked into a house and not been given a hug and offered uh, a glass of chai. And 
uh, I think that that was that was it was the rhetoric that I had always heard about Islam here, specifically in the American South after 9/11, was just not anything that that I was experiencing on the ground. And I think to trace to a specific example of like where like where my thoughts started changing was um, I was standing. We were opening up a mausoleum. USAID gave some money to open up a mausoleum by the Ghazi Soccer Stadium in Kabul. That's a um, really poor neighborhood, and there's a central water point. And like after school, the kids would have to do chores, like take the donkey and get water, and go get water and this, that, and the other. So there's a lot of kids walking up and down the street by this mausoleum, and I'm standing by the trucks because I was the driver of the trucks, so we had to stand by the trucks. And a little kid comes up to me, the little boy is probably five to seven. And he says, Kalam, Kalam. I said, I don't know what you're, I don't, I don't, I don't know what you're saying. Samir, come here. So I called over my interpreter, and the interpreter, I, I asked the interpreter to ask him what he wants, and he says, a pen. And I was used to kids asking for a Glock or some Oakley sunglasses yeah. or like an expensive watch or this, that, and the other. And I was like, what does he want a pen for? And he pulls out, he, he has like a little satchel bag, and he pulls out an English workbook. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I don't know what he said, but to paraphrase, he was basically like, I just want to learn English so I can get my family out of the shithole. And you know, take all the pens. Yeah. Take all the pens. And I think over time, reflecting on that, I really, really, that was one of the things that really checked mm -hmm. the fuck out of my privilege. And um, over time, I just started really, really thinking about it. And um, I decided that I wanted to not be complicit in a system that I think that's more, it's really, really interesting. The Special Forces motto is uh, De Oppresso Liber, mm -hmm. to free the oppressed, and I don't think we're doing much of that. Mm -hmm. um, so over time, yeah, I just started reflecting, and I wanted to learn more about Islam. Um, so that's kind of what led me to, to, um, to UNCW, to the religion department at UNCW. But um, you said extremely, I don't remember where I was going to go with that, but, um, oh yeah, and, and to this, to, at this point, knowing what I know now and having read everything that I read now, um, I view terrorism as a language, mm -hmm. um, and I view the onus on, on reducing terrorism as on the oppressor and not the oppressed. So if we want to limit terrorism, then let's stop bombing civilians in Mosul. Let's stop doing this yeah. and creating insurgency and giving people reasons to hate the United States of America. And I have a lot of I have a lot of a lot of respect, like the utmost respect for, for veterans because they, they sign a, a line that many people don't. Um, and I think that, that that there's something to be said about that, but at the same time, um, this idea that they're protecting us from something I'm not entirely convinced mm -hmm. that they're protecting us from some that our military is protecting us from some force that we're not creating by having the military in the first place and, and not necessarily the military um, I think that militaries are necessary in in the current nationalist yeah. um, setup that we have the, the current national geopolitical mm -hmm. system that we have um, based on sovereignty but I don't think that that's necessarily the way that we need to be doing geopolitics in the first place. So I, I think that's what it that's what it comes down to for me is that mm -hmm. we all oppress someone in some sort of way. Yeah. Um, and I think recognizing that and holding ourselves accountable for that first, and looking in the mirror at night mm -hmm. and saying, "What did I do today?" Yeah. Me, like me, it's hard for me to get away from my maleness. Yeah. Um, I'll be the first one to say that. And, a lot of the things that I that I say even it's built into the language. I think patriarchy is built into the language and the way that we walk through the world. Um, I think necessarily necessarily um, I don't know how I want to phrase this. It's necessarily problematic. Just yeah. the just the way that we learn language, the way that we learn culture, yeah. this, that yeah. and the other, we take these things as normative and there's no such thing as normative. So just holding ourselves accountable and, and, and looking at each other. And I think that that's one of the most important things about, about my story is that I've, I've sat back and I, I've 
fallen on the sword. It's like, yeah. yes, I am problematic and I recognize that I'm problematic and I'm always going to be problematic. Yeah. Check me on my shit when I'm fucked up. Yeah. Um, and I think that that's important and I think that that's a lesson that, that we could learn um, as a... Insurgency and, you know, um, how dropping the bombs, you know, maybe just creates more insurgents. I feel like we handle a lot of domestic problems in, in that way in the United States too. And, you know, with... Uh, get tough on crime type of bills and stuff like that and we don't often look at the the root of why somebody is doing something and that's kind of you know like the easy way out yeah I, w I would definitely agree um, I think the, the greatest the greatest flaw in domestic policy uh, I mean shit back to con capital policing policing came out of a, a societal context of slavery and night patrols and mm -hmm. slave patrols. Um, and then it just, we, we vested more, more power into that institution um, to the point where it, it's, just, it, it's just disgusting. And I think one of the problems, again, language. Language, I'm very, very interested in, in language. Yeah. Of the roles that that language plays in uh, perpetuating white supremacy specifically, but um, yeah, law enforcement and crime prevention. Right. Mm -hmm. So we call it law enforcement, but really, what we're doing with police departments and sheriff's departments and law enforcement agencies generally is crime prevention. Now, the problem with that, I don't disagree with crime prevention. I think we do need to be doing crime prevention. Mm -hmm. but what does that look like? Yeah. What should that look yeah. like? For me, I think that looks like equitable housing. I think yeah. that looks like um, access to economies so we don't have to resort to illegal economies that are illegalized in the first place. Um, it comes down to democracy because whenever you really look at it, if we're talking about democracy, then shouldn't the people that explicitly disagree with the rules that are on the books i.e. those that are incarcerated, should they not have a vote in what those rules are? Mm -hmm. So whenever we're disenfranchising people because they disagree with the rules in the first place, there's nothing that is, is this idea of, of some drugs being drugs and some drugs being medicines. And I think a lot of the times, especially this, this war on drugs, for example, I think that back to the language. Yeah. Whenever yeah. you call something a war, then you're going to have to yeah. that, Right? So mm -hmm. you're no longer are viewing... Um, civilians, citizens of the United States, as citizens of the United States, you're viewing them as combatants to the state. Yeah. Um, and I think that that's a, that's a, that's a key point to, to one of the things. That what do you saying. think about police, uh, you know, having some of the same equipment that you had in Afghanistan? It's disgusting. <laughs> <laughs> to be quite frank, I, agree. I yeah. think it's disgusting. Yeah. Uh, I forgot the documentary. Uh, man, what is the documentary called? I don't remember. Um, but they go to a um, the filmmaker like films a, a city council meeting in like mm -hmm. Concord. Yeah. Or something like that, and they're like, "We need an MRAP." For those of y'all that don't know, uh, MRAP is a mine resistant ambush protected vehicle. Mm -hmm. There's been like one murder in Concord or something like yeah. that in like the last ten years. Uh -huh. and like, we need a mine resistant vehicle. Like, who's putting mines in the street? What do you need this for? But then that that's where the that's where you tie in the economy and this, that, and the other. Yeah. Um, and the economic gain that we have through this military industrial complex, through these wars that we've perpetuated since nineteen seventy one when Richard Nixon announced the war on drugs. Yeah. Um, I think that yeah, it's it's an economic impetus for a, a small group of of people in an enterprise that is built on mm -hmm. on violence that we don't view as violent. Yeah, I think that whole mentality of you know we are at war with our our fellow citizens is so destructive, like in itself, because the police end up going out on their jobs with this kind of warped mentality that the people that, the neighborhoods that they're policing, they're policing the enemy almost when they're really supposed to be protecting and serving. 
Yeah, and and that's that's one of the that's that's another interest is like who's being policed in the first place, right? If we were to go on to UNCW and we were to go through all the dorms mm -hmm. um, and search all the dorms, how many people would illegally have Adderall? A lot. A lot. <laughs> yeah. A lot. Yeah. A lot. Yeah. But they're not going yeah. through the dorms at UNCW. Yeah. They're not be white people aren't being policed to yeah. the extent in which black people and yeah, and, and, the and, and and not to mention like one of the really, really interesting things or, or one of the, the really terrible policies that I'm interested in is like countering violence extremism. Mm -hmm. So now you've lumped Muslims into this category as well. So surveillance and the sophistication of surveillance in the United States is growing exponentially, I think. And yeah, so um, yeah, policing is, is really, really, really a site of something that, that I think needs to get better, but I don't foresee it getting better 